when they graduate, are $25,000 in debt. And that does not include loans taken out by their parents, which if that was included, then the average indebtedness of the American college student graduating in 2011 would be $35,000. So I would never have put these two subjects together, student debt and the failure of development in Japan, were it not for those at Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Toledo, Occupy Oakland, all over, who are making us think of what is the relationship between international capitalism and our own lives. Okay. On this very page, they have a beautiful picture of a world champion marathon on as the zenith or acme of human life. Can we put as much training in our struggle for a human life as the runner puts in to run 26 miles fast? We can only do this with the discussions, worldwide discussions, worldwide teachings, that our Fukushima Wall Street Forum is initiating today with Manuel Yang, a graduate of our department, a very interesting graduate because his thesis was, defend was defended before the department's leading British historian before its leading American historian, and before its leading Asian historian. Manuel Yang has been a person of the world and recognized as such in his training in our department. And now he comes to us with a report of this nuclear disaster and is helping us now to make sense of the world that we're trying to change. Let's give him a rousing welcome. <laughs> I think I'm afraid I'm going to have to start with a whimper because we have some technical issues. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. Uh, so we'll wait and see if that's going to work. Um, I'll just give a little intro as to why am I here or what I've been doing for the last uh, three months in the past year and why is it relevant to talk about Fukushima in relation to myself. I was in Japan from uh, November of last year to January of this year. And uh, I met a lot of people there. I met people who were involved in the anti-G8 struggle, the anti-globalization struggle. Uh, and a lot of the connections I got made from that particular uh, encounter between November and January, I wanted to resume uh, this summer. But after I came back to Toledo in January, actually end of January and uh, beginning of February, and. Uh, the Arab Spring was in the air, and we were discussing on Facebook with my Japanese friends uh, how to respond to that particular event. And one response we had was to organize a special issue on the uh, Arab Spring uh, for this particular journal called Gendai Shiso. It's like a leading Japanese philosophical theoretical journal, which also has a very wide public audience. And so my friends were connected to this particular journal, so he, they asked me to translate an uh, interview by Vijay Prashad, a leading American historian of the third world, who was commenting on the Arab Spring. And then 3.11 happened. Uh, the tsunami, the earthquake, the nuclear disaster, all rolling to one. And uh, all of us, myself included, uh, at the time in Toledo, in the blizzard, as I was glued to the internet TV, I was completely uh, both entranced and f I felt completely helpless, you know, of all these sceneries of sublime destruction. And uh, my friends, of course, were in a state of shock. Fortunately, all the people that I knew were safe. They were either in Tokyo, about a couple hundred miles away from uh, Fukushima. But, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people died just from the tsunami. 
And uh, a lot of the discussions about Eric's drink was sort of interrupted briefly. And I wanted to figure out exactly what was going on among the Japanese friends, the situation. And uh, I was going to Japan anyway uh, this summer for a conference in Kobe. So I decided to go a little bit early, about a month early, in the beginning of June, uh, three months after the disaster. So I took a flight, went to Japan, and stayed there for about three and a half months. Took a brief detour to Korea, to Seoul, which I may mention if I have time. Um, for lack of, lack of images, I'm going to just talk as if the images are there. Although I'm not sure if I remember them because I put this together in the last couple of days. I, uh, I wasn't really planning to speak uh, extensively. Uh, Peter sent me an email. He asked me to speak to the Occupy Toledo, perhaps to Occupy Ann Arbor, and the Occupy movement around the area. So I thought I was just going to give an impromptu speech of encouragement, perhaps. When I was in Seoul, I mentioned going to Seoul, uh, I was asked by a, uh, there's an activist scholar commune called Siyunomo. There are different branches of it. And in this particular group, Siyunomo R, the branch, focuses on direct action on the ground. There's all kinds of occupation taking place before the, the U.S. occupation movement started. And one occupation in Korea and Seoul was over this huge section of Seoul, which was being redeveloped. Construction companies were hiring thugs, essentially to take people out, to take people away from these places. And uh, this particular cafe, Cafe Marie, uh, became a sort of a hub of activists and all kinds of people. And when I was invited to go there, I was honored to be there. But without really knowing who I was, the people, the occupier there, students, old people, soldiers, uh, they asked me to give a speech. You know, so. I tried to do my best to talk about Toledo, try to relate to what was going on in Korea. And uh, that took only about half, you know, a couple minutes or so. So that's what I was kind of expecting to do today. So last night I was putting together all these images, pictures I took in Japan and, uh, and also in Washington. So if this doesn't work out, uh, you can at least imagine those pictures, those images. Uh, or I'll put them up on a website somewhere and you can take a look at them later. So the first image that, was, that I wanted to show uh, was an image from a section of Tokyo called Sanya. And uh, this is a section of Tokyo that is uh, probably the most proletarian section. There's the equivalent of that in, in Western Japan, in Osaka. And Sanya has been a hotbed of struggle since, you know, as long as you can remember perhaps the 18th and 19th century uh, could be a good point of departure because it's an area in which the Japanese outcast, the untouchables, the, the so-called Baraku today used to be called Hitahini, uh, used to live there. And it was a sort of autonomous zone reflecting the sort of hierarchical relationship of, of feudal Japan. But since post-war, as to say 1945 Japan, the place has been turned into a section uh, which absorbed all the uh, elements of the of the the lowest of a low within the working class, the day laborers. Uh, it's changed over the years. Probably the height of the struggle was in the 1970s, when there was a huge barricade set up in that place against uh, against the different kinds of thugs. Similar in Korea, but basically the, uh, the Japanese mafia, the yakuza, were attacking these workers who were trying to organize themselves in the 1970s. Well, this is one pole of labor for the nuclear workers in Fukushima. And another pool of labor for the nuclear workers is in Western Osaka, whose pictures I was gonna to show too from, uh, uh, it's the one from, this one, good. In Kamagasaki, which you will see soon. So, excellent, beautiful. All right, and yeah, where's that picture from? This is a um, this one. Okay, this is a picture from 9/11. That's right, a picture of, from 9/11 of this year. We had a demo, anti-nuclear demo, 
in Tokyo. There's been a demo month after month after month after the accident. So this is taken from 9-11. You can see these people dressed up in different ways. This is a very untraditional kinds of demo. Before 3-11, Japan virtually had zero demonstrations. I mean, they had demonstrations, but only the minorities were usually sectarian, leftists of various persuasions with the Communist Party, very traditional, very uh, uh, serious, earnest, you know, shouting slogans. But these people came after 3-11. And I'll tell, I'll tell you a little more about these people, but I want to start with where I was uh, going from. This is uh, Sanya, place I mentioned. Now, this is an interesting place. Um, three of my friends, he is a scholar of Kamagasaki, Western Japan, Osaka, day workers. I mean, he knows everything about Kamagasaki since the 1960s. All the riots, all the riots in Japan took place from in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s in Kamagasaki, Osaka. It's a place that's been neglected and left behind by Japanese post-war economic growth. So he's a specialist. He taught me a lot. We worked together. And he, Tomotsune, is a scholar of the Barak, of the untouchables. He's worked in this area for many, many years. And he's also a scholar of Yoshimoto, Rimei, the Japanese new left thinker. Um, so and this, this man has been working in the middle uh, as an activist since the 1960s or 70s uh, with the day laborers in this area, you know, cooking and, and just working with different groups. And he's actually one of the most important editors of a big publishing company in Japan. So these three people, especially these two guys, gave us a guide and tour of Sanya in Tokyo. So this place, I mentioned, this goes back historically to the roots of uh, Japanese feudalism. Well, this particular place is, a, as you can see, a Buddhist temple. Okay, this is a burial site. And when I came to this place, I thought of Peter's work, because it's deeply connected to his work, which took me to Toledo in the first place. This Buddhist statue is called uh, Kubiki Jizo, the decapitation bodhisattva. It was built in commemoration of all the workers from the 17th century onwards who were executed on this very place. This is an execution ground right next to the burial site. In the 1650s, this uh, execution place was set up. And mid 17th century, and uh, the place was a complete inferno in the mid 17th century. I mean, the bodies of all the criminals were executed, were thrown to the dogs, and all kinds of animals were eating them alive. Or not alive, but eating the carcasses. So very hideous, awful, hellish place. And the, this Buddhist priest decided to set up a burial site to bury these people. And by the way, this is also the place close to not just the untouchables, but also to the, uh, the pleasure quarters, the sex workers, the prostitutes of the feudal Japan. Their body used to be thrown, you know, without any kind of burial rituals into these temples. Well, anyway, the reason I mention this place, this place of death in the working class, is because of our situation today. And it's very deeply related. It kind of made me think. You know how to relate Fukushima and Wall Street. So I'll try my best to link it. Um, and I hope you guys can help. Okay. This is uh, deeply connected to the earlier scene. This is a, a translation into Japanese 120 years later, uh, in the 1770s, of a book. It's a book that the Japanese scholars, Dutch studies, was a name, name of the, the scholars uh, group, basically the elite of feudal Japan, who wanted to learn something about Western science. But because Japan was an isolationist country at the time, they could only do so uh, partially in secret and partially in the margins. But they were still part of the elite. And they wanted to know about the human body. So they decided to translate a book from Dutch, uh, originally written in German, because uh, the Dutch were the only imperial western, well, only western country which was allowed to trade with Japan for 250 years or so until the isolation broke. So these guys, these Dutch scholars from Japan are in the same execution ground that I just mentioned in the 1770s. What are they doing there? They're looking at a dissection of a human body. They were impressed by this Dutch book of anatomy or German book of anatomy. 
and they wanted to see how accurate it was. So they brought these copies, and they were looking at these dead bodies that they didn't touch themselves. They didn't dissect it themselves because the body of the dead were considered to be, you know, unlucky, you know, suspicious, etc. So they let the lowest of the low, the untouchables, do the work of dissection. And they were watching this, and they were so impressed by the accuracy, they decided to work together and publish this book into Japanese. It took them three and a half years, um, 1770s. Well, let's go back to the 16, um, 1630s, 20 years before that execution was uh, established in Japan. This is a painting by Rembrandt. It's a painting called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. That's Nicholas Tulp right here. And he painted this in the 1630s in honor of this major figure, Tulp, Dr. Tulp who was uh, the leading head of the Surgeon's Guild in Amsterdam, Holland, Dutch, Dutch capitalism, the Dutch Empire. He was not just a head surgeon. He was also the, the treasurer, the magistrate, and later the mayor of Amsterdam. So he was really at the center of mercantile capital that would spread into the, uh, the Americas. And you can see him pointing at the dead body also of a criminal, Aris Kint. He was strangulated by, you know, he was a robber. Strangulated only a couple hours before this particular examination. They could only do this kind of public showing of dissection once a year at that time. And notice that he's not touching, he's not dissecting, because he does not do the dissection himself. It's very similar to Japan, except in this case, it's his, uh, you know, his uh, people who's working under him who's doing the dissection. And he's teaching them about how the body works. This same man, according to uh, some evidence that were picked up in the 1980s at the bottom of the New York uh, City Library, was also the man who did the medical examination for the Dutch colonist who went to America, New Amsterdam. And New Am Amsterdam is the place where they set up the wall. 20 years later, 16. Actually, about a decade later, in the 1640s, this is, uh, this is Wall Street, the origin of Wall Street in the 1640s. And they did this to enclose the land, to protect you know, private property away from the indigenous population. I was going to ask Al a question, because we're talking about this, about the uh, difference between you know, Dutch colonialism in America with the British one. And uh, I wonder if you've been here. Well, the Dutch were far more single-minded than, uh, than the Puritans in New England in simply pursuing mercantile advantage. They made very little pretext about civilizing or uplifting the Indians. They simply used them. With the Indians up the Hudson River who could provide fur trade, they established alliances. With the Indians on Long Island who were in the way, their policy was one of extermination. And they hired the biggest Indian killer in New England, John Underhill, to carry out the good work that he did at Fort Mystic. A fascinating thing to me about the Dutch is the way in which they took an Indian ritual object, wampum, and turned it into a form of currency that enhanced their development of economic control in that particular area. So to make a long story as short as I can, these people didn't bother with a lot of candid hypocrisy about uplifting Indians. From the very outset, they used them for exploitation and they used them very effectively and built great wealth in the, in the consequence. And they were quite capable of selective terrorism. Um, it's an ugly story, but it shows you European imperialism in contact with, <coughs> with indigenous peoples in, in its most naked form. Yeah, the point I wanted to make with this wall is uh, the point that Al so eloquently made, which is the relationship between these walls, these enclosures of land of property with genocide. I mean, this is something Marx talks about in Party <coughs> the of Capital, right? The pr primary accumulation, which is a process in which land is you know, taken away from the peasants of uh, England and the rest of the world, the indigenous population. And that is always uh, con closely connected to, to mass death. And I would argue also executions of the kind that you know, we just briefly saw. So this is uh, 130 years later. This is the 
you know, in the same area. This is the origin of uh, the stock market. This is a Budmore Agreement of 1792. Uh, like 24 merchants in uh, New York decided to bond together to protect their own interests, to enclose their own economic interests away from, not this time the indigenous population, but competing capitalists and auctioneers, as they were called. And in order to be a member, you had to pay a large sum of money, and the membership was very select. So I think one of the points I want to make here, and this is a, a proposition, I want to still really think through this empirically and with all of you, which is uh, the relationship between the financial market, the development of this abstract entity which we think is bloodless and computerized today, and which we think is really the, the fulcrum, at least in certain circles, of uh, progress, economic progress. This bloodless abstract thing in the relationship with what we saw, genocide and the walling of, of property. I would like to argue that uh, uh, the genocide and enclosure made possible the emergence of the financial market. And when the financial market emerged, it enabled the hiding, the concealment of the acts, the brutal acts of enclosure. So a year later, in, in 1793, I'm kind of doing this for local, not just for local color, but because it's a really important point. Uh, there was a Western Confederation of uh, the indigenous people in this area. And there was a big battle that was fought on fallen timber. And this is a picture, unfortunately, from the perspective of the cavalry, which was uh, Mad Anthony Wayne, which is killing the, uh, the blue jacket and his people. Uh, there was one figure, of course, who refuses to sign the treaty, treaty of Greenville, which basically allows the the Americans, the whites, to expropriate the land, and that was Tecumseh, uh, who's, uh, who's a rebellion of 1811. Uh, Peter talks about it very vividly in this great pamphlet that he wrote this year in commemoration of the Luddites, connecting the Luddites, the machine breakers of England, with the indigenous struggles of uh, America. I want to jump uh, centuries. I, I mean, you know, I'm going to jump centuries because of lack of time and because of uh, I don't know how else to really talk about this, uh, except in terms of leaps. This is a building, as you can see. It was built in 1947. That uh, the wealth that uh, the United States had made on the lands of the indigenous, on the lands of slavery, by 1947, you know, U.S. was able to uh, really seize the moment in a way, become the new empire after the Dutch and the British, the U.S. And I think 1945 was a critical moment of a turning point for the emergence of the American empire. The American empire existed from the very beginning, but it became, if you will, hegemonic in 1945. And as you know, as all of us know, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is a point of origin of the, of the nuclear Cold War. And this is in Hiroshima. This is what the American occupation set up in 1947. It's called ABCC, the Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission, and this is where all the lies and deceit of the Japanese government and scientists are coming from. Because in 1947, when ABCC was established, what they did, the American military uh, medical team did, was to refuse, refuse to treat any of the bomb victims. Zero treatment. But they wanted to observe them, dissect them, take pictures, write books about it, send dead bodies, take the dead bodies of the bomb victims forcibly from families and take them back to the U US in secret, chop them up into pieces and put them in jars. It was a struggle for the Japanese families to get these dead bodies back to their families. And they came back in just a grotesque pieces in a jar. Well, anyway, this is uh, uh, the commission I was set up to really see the effect of radiation. You know. Uh, and these are the people who wanted to argue, and who did argue, that radiation is just a matter of direct exposure. The things like internal exposure, you know, eating radioactive food is not really an issue. They were focused solely on you know, direct exposure. And how is that going to affect people? How can we use it for the purpose of you know, conquering and maintaining this, this empire in, after World War II? 
Well, this pl this building uh, actually not just had American doctors, but also trained Japanese doctors and Japanese scientists. In 1975, it uh, it was given over to the Japanese, but its purpose and its particular structure didn't really change, and it was renamed the Radiation Effect Facility or Lab, and they trained the best and the finest scholars uh, in Japan who are now speaking for the government saying that Chernobyl's effect was minimal. Maybe it gave a few leukemia, but basically it was safe and you have nothing to worry about uh, the Fukushima accident. So this is where the industry of lies and propaganda started. Um, I was going to show a video, but I don't think I have time for that. Um, and uh, now this is a, another structure you can see built. This is in Osaka. I mentioned earlier, Kamagasaki. This is the this is a counterpart of what was seen at the very beginning in Sanya. Kamagasaki. I actually, my first week in Japan, actually uh, slept here because of the cheapest room and board. It's become kind of a mecca for backpackers, for foreigners too, because it's so cheap to live. Uh, these these hotels. I mean, there's no private bathroom, but you can. And there's so many homeless, which you never see in the rest of Japan. They're all concentrated here. And this is where the, the, the mafia recruiters of nuclear workers come, often under deceit, saying, you know, we got a job for you. You can drive a car. It's really cool. Just get on the truck. And by the time they get to where they think it's going to be a safe and sanitary job, it's Fukushima. And uh, they have to work there. Um, so people live in, around this area. And this is a, that was a part of that park. This is the entrance, the inside of the park. It's called the Triang Triangle Park. And the struggles in, you know, Kamagasaki has shifted over the years from the 70s. And this is a, I took this picture last year. These are all homeless, you know, day laborers. Um, and you can see in the back, it says the 40th Kamagasaki overcoming the winter struggle. This is really a, a legacy of the struggles of the 1970s. There's still groups working there, church groups, Christian groups, uh, you know, militant Marxist groups. My friends were filmmakers, documentary filmmakers work there. And it says here, uh, do not let, uh, there should be nobody starving or dying frozen among us. Mm. And don't let people sleep on the streets. It's the country's responsibility to create jobs. And... Um, any kind of policies or uh, move on the part of government to promote war or exclusion, racism should be completely opposed. And uh, the official and the day laborers, the part-time workers, have to, you know, should create a solidarity. Uh, mostly these are just slogans, you know, but, uh, you know, people have been really hard working hard to try to organize these people. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, I'm gonna, again, jump places from Kamagasaki, Osaka, from the site of workers. Some of the workers in that, I'm sure that some of the pictures, some of the images of those workers you saw come from this place. This is Okinawa. I stay there for about a week. Um, Okinawa is, a, is a, in a way, dreadful place and also a very fantastic place. It's a dreadful place because the Cold War still is still fought there, and uh, and the reason is because of the basis. In 1945, as you know, the occupation started in the 50s. The U.S. occupation stopped, except in Okinawa. So it went on until the 1970s. A few years before the that facility that I mentioned, ABCC facility, was given over to the Japanese. It was finally made part of Japan. But to this day, the best lands the Best facilities are still enclosed, given over, and dominated by the American military. Um, and this is close to a place called Kadena Military Base. And one of my uh, friends took me there, gave me a great guide. And uh, this is, uh, this, I took this picture from a bathroom, from a, from a, from a man's toilet, from a window. Because uh, this sign really captured my interest. It says, uh, military base workers, labor management uh, department, the Okinawa department. So this is where all the Japanese 
people who only the only Japanese people were allowed on the base as mm -hmm. servants, workers, menial jobs, you know, go for labor. And uh, oh, by the way, when I was there, uh, when I was speaking to my guy, uh, who is a scholar of the of U.S. Uh, military uh, bases mm -hmm. in Japan, in Okinawa, and this is, you know, looking at from the, a different angle. Uh, you can see this is an entire military base. It's huge. And this, I was asking my friend, what is this? This is, looks like, you know, somebody are farming. Apparently there are people who refuse the idea of enclosure. And they want to subsist. They want to create a place of <coughs> subsistence. This place is completely illegal, right, by, this, by the logic of the American empire. But uh, farmers have decided to, you know, cultivate things anyway. Organic garden <coughs> like, you know, bike and grass and the rest of them. So it's in a precarious position. It could be shut down any time, but they're still trying to subsist. Some of them are trying to subsist through, you know, using the land just right outside the enclosure. Um, this is from a People's Museum in Okinawa. And this is a point that was really made strenuously by one of my friends, the former editor of that journal I mentioned, Gendai Shiso who came to New York to talk about it because after you know, resigning from his position, he's become a, a fervent, powerful, articulate historian and activist of the nuclear power. And he's the one who taught me about the history of the 1950s, the grassroots struggle among the Japanese workers to, to write poetry, you know, like we used to do in BG a couple of years ago. Factory workers would write poetry, make circles. A lot of this was organized by the Communist Party. And for the Communist Party, the cow was really important, not just for the party, but for people today, for farmers in Fukushima. So my friend, my for, you know, said to the Americans, talking at the Blue Stocking Bookstore, which is this great bookstore in Lower East Side, New York, about Fukushima. He said, and I wish I brought this uh, issue of uh, this radical kind of newsletter paper, which was talking about Wall Street occupation. And there was a huge picture of a bull as capital, and people were fighting it. Um, and Ikigami, <coughs> Oshiko said, you know, this is, this is, I mean, we support your movement, but for us, for the farmers of Fukushima, the cows are the working class. You know, the farmers have taken their, their cows to, to the demonstrations. And uh, so this is actually also the case in Okinawa as well. Um, after going to the People's Museum, I went to uh, Ie Island, or Ieshima. Uh, it's an island off of, it's part of Okinawa, but the Okinawa is made up of different islands. And Ia Island, like many other places in Okinawa, lives in the memory of death. And the concentration of death in Okinawa is expressed through places like this. It, this is a place called ah, ah, Ahashagama, which is a cave. In 1945, 115 villagers was forced to commit suicide here by the Japanese military. And this is the inside. You know, you, uh, a couple of my friends who guided me in, you know, they, they're not particularly religious, but they, you know, gave religious homage before coming in and stepping in because uh, you know, the spirits of the dead, the executed, live here. And uh, this is what it looks like inside. So the Okinawans had to endure forcible execution or suicide by the Japanese military before it's uh, declaring defeat. And after, the U.S. occupation had to struggle anew, and uh, with the new enclosures like this that started to get built around the different places of Okinawa. Um, as you can see, this is a this is a fence, barbed wire, both in English and Japanese. And since it says no photography, I can resist. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a military training base, the Ishima training facility. This is where the U.S. Uh, soldiers go and train, make a lot of noise because of their machinery, destroy the ecology. And this particular island has been one of the sparks of the Japanese peace movement in, in post-war Japan. The landlords actually have struggled mightily against U.S. occupation. So this is one sign that you can find from 1955, May 1955. Let me kind of translate this briefly because I think it's very... It might be dated in the rhetoric, but it's very interesting. So the landlords 
you know, in Ieshima decided to organize. And this is basically a proclamation to the U.S. military. One, this land is, return our land because this is our country and this village, this is our village and this is our soil. One, learn from the tragedy of Tojo, the Japanese imperialist or war mongers, uh, in Ito Hirobu. Your loving families away from you back home in the U.S. One, listen to the advice and admonition of the holy peasants. If you do so, the United States will live longer, prosper forever, and all of you will live in happiness. Mm. And there's two quotations. One is, as you can see here, there's parentheses. It says, those who live by the sword die by the sword, the Bible. And the second quotation, those, those countries which have bases will die or destroy themselves by the bases. And the quotation here, it says history. <laughs> Leaving the island, uh, my two friends took me to a wonderful place, one of the most uh, resounding sites of struggle in Okinawa, which is uh, Takae. Takae is a kind of a place where there are a lot of forests, a lot of mountains, and uh, the U.S. has been trying to build a training facility, uh, a helipad, basically for helicopters to land, very dangerous helicopter, what's called the Osplay, which has been, I think, called the Widowmaker because of its dangerous design. A lot of controversy, even within the U.S. military uh, personnel who have criticized this for being absolutely dangerous. So not, it's not only dangerous for people who, who ride in it, the soldiers, but also for people who live there, who have their own village, community, their crops, etc. So there's been a movement to occupy that place. They don't call it an occupation, they call it a sit-in, or sit-down, or, you know, organizing. And uh, there was a kind of, I mean, it goes back and, back, back and forth in terms of the rhythm and intensity of these, these sit-ins. Sometimes there was a lot of people. When I was there, there was only one person, maybe a couple people there. But every weekend, uh, this particular, and these are the, the banners that are placed alongside the fence with a van. And this says, uh, those who completely stamp on the will of the, of the resident and inhabitants, uh, which is the Takai helipad construction, were completely opposed to it. And these are people, I think lawyers from Kyoto, who put this up in solidarity. And a few hours away from that place, there's another side of the struggle. There's two sides. One, the other one, this is uh, along the seashore. And uh, this is a kind of holy site, as you can see, a shrine. Very beautiful. It's called Hinoko. And uh, many sea creatures live there. Long, many millennia of customs still vibrate. The problem is the U.S. military, of course, are trying to train their soldiers and enclose the land. So there's been a sit-in. And they've set up a fence relatively recently. And the people have still put up these posters opposing the bases. Uh, what I liked about uh, the different sign, this is one of my favorites. This is a sign that's up, you know, close to that fence. It was put up by the city uh, government. It says here, basically, the uh -huh. beach is everybody's treasure. Let's take away, uh, take, home, take, take home the trash. And somebody wrote, the bases. <laughs> okay. This is Tokyo. Now, this is a kind of hard to link what's going on in Okinawa with what's going on in Tokyo, which is responding to Fukushima, a nuclear accident. But let me try, just briefly, on a personal basis. This guy here, he's a graduate student in Hitotsubashi, very prestigious university in, in Tokyo, a student of C.R. James, post-colonial uh, you know, scholar, and he, we became friends, and he is very active in the Okinawan struggle. That's really what politicized him. And he's at the anti-nuclear demo in Tokyo. I think this was 9-11, on the, the very same picture that you saw, it's from the same demo. A uh, couple, couple words, or a few words about the Japanese police. Uh, in March of this year, after the nuclear accidents, uh, in later that month, the first demos were organized. Uh, they were organized by 
people call the amateurs revolt. Uh, these are people who have a section in Koenji. They're not left wingers in the usual sense of the word. They basically had recycle shops, used closing stores, became friends with neighbors in this particular these streets. In the process, though, they also wanted, you know, punk rockers and such people, subcultural people. But they also figure, you know, they don't like mainstream Japanese uh, fetishism of wealth. They just want to live poor but happy. And they organized a lot of demos before 311 against many issues. Only hundreds of people, at most a thousand, showed up. So they figured after 311, at most of only 1,500 people are going to show up to this demo against a nuclear accident, nuclear disaster. Ten times that number showed up, 15,000. And they couldn't, you know, they were no longer the organizers. They just became members of a movement. <laughs> so that this is one result of that. This is happening every month. But the police has been very, very, uh, very uh, over-regulated, over-regulatory in relation to the movement since the 1970s. I mean, those of you who are familiar with going to demos will be, I think, shocked by the nature of the Japanese de demonstrations. Because uh, basically, we can't really walk. I mean, we're stuck in a place. The police are surrounding us. And they let us walk. Sometimes you have to wait for half an hour. And they divide up all the demonstrators into small sizes. So you know, people who are just passing by think it's a really small nothing. And this technique has developed in the 19, since the 70s, after the movement has went into decline. But they're reviving it much more severely against the anti-nuclear demos. And, uh, so the police are all lined up and we can't move and we just have to follow orders uh, because in Japan, once you get arrested, they can keep you in jail for 23 days without charging you. It's a technique to really destroy activists that the police developed since the 1970s. You know, I mean, after 23 days, you lose your job. You lose your legitimacy, respectability in the community, et cetera, et cetera. You become a criminal, uh, et cetera. But now the police are not really able to use this tactic so well. 9-11, the first mass arrest, at least by Japanese standards, took place after 3-11. 12 people got arrested. I was witness to one of the arrests. It was ridiculous. Nobody was doing anything. This woman was just in tears. And the police were just grabbing and taking her away. But the police, after a few weeks, had to let her go, even though the trial was going to happen in the future, because it's no longer the left-wing activists, professional so-called revolutionaries who are doing the organizing or who are part of the demonstrations. It's just people who, any people, just ordinary folks. And if you start arresting those people off the streets, the media backlash is going to be severe. So the police is very mm -hmm. careful about that too. And I'm so glad to see a, uh, an old woman there who wasn't part of the demo just looking at these people walking and clapping. This is a huge victory because before 311, demonstrators were considered to be dangerous. You know, this is a propaganda that the, the Japanese state and consumerism was able to really indoctrinate with, into people. But people's minds are already changing. Except for these people, um, this is where the, some of the arrests took place. These people are, uh, I don't even want to call them nationalists, uh, the right wing. They're basically a hate group, a right wing hate group that even attacks nationalists and right wingers were too moderate. And it says here, we're opposed to any radical anti-nuclear demonstrations. Do not decide the future of our country with emotions. And all they're doing on their microphone is screaming epithets. You know, calling us all kinds of just awful names. Awful names. But even among this group, it's called um, Zazaitokai. They're especially, for example, one of their targets of attack is the, the Japanese Koreans, the Zainichi. Basically, that the Korean Japanese have privileges that the ordinary Japanese don't have. You know, they should give up those privileges, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but even in this group, after 311, there's been a split because there are people who want to oppose nuclear power. So even the configuration of the right wing, these political alliances are, are changing in flux. And this takes us to occupational. Occupy Wall Street. This is just a thing that I saw on the street of New York. These kinds of graffiti are all over the place. In the bathrooms, on the subway stations, all over. And this is on the, obviously on the fence in Brooklyn. Well, I saw this fellow 
at Liberty yeah. Park, Zuccotti Park. Have you seen this guy? Benny Zabel, yeah, from Australia. Oh, really? Yeah. What do you know about him? I know he's been there. He's leaving in about a week to go back to Australia. And he's had a very major presence there for over a month. Yeah. And he's kind of well liked by everybody that I know that has been on there. I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but I only saw him from the back because he seemed to be preoccupied with something. But, you know, striking that he carries the anti nuclear message. No more Hiroshima, no nukes, never again at the Zuccotti Park. This is one of the linkages here. This guy uh, is a linkage between the anti nuclear movement in Japan, that's ongoing, and the occupation. This guy is Matsumoto Hajime. He's one of the quote unquote leaders. There's no leader in the amateurs revolt that I mentioned. Those, that organization, the ragtag group of people, young people who just want to have fun and also do something against the system. And he is uh, the guy who kind of started this whole movement, the Cohen. And he's obviously wearing a leather jacket that said Occupy Wall Street. And he and his comrades uh, lived there, stayed there for a week in a tent. Uh, I didn't. In New York. In New York. This was uh, last week. And we had a dialogue between these guys who helped give birth to the anti-nuclear movement post sleep 311 and people from Occupy Wall Street at the new school, which you can watch on YouTube. Okay, so these two people are my friends. They're very they have powerful voices, one from Osaka, Goto Ayumi, who, who, who studies uh, not just the movements of Osaka among day laborers, but who are active in it. You know, who's so active in it that her professor, who's also a very radical, committed figure, you know, has been kind of worried about her. But uh, she is also translating the work of Sylvia Federici, uh, Caliban and the Witch, co-translating it. And Shiga Kinoshita, he's the man who really helped me out in Tokyo. He's a political scientist in Tokyo. I basically stayed at his place for over a month and a half. <laughs> Complete generosity. You know, a true communist in the best sense of the word. And he, they came to uh, New York to speak about Fukushima. And it was so wonderful to see them talk in four different places, including Blue Stocking that I mentioned. Um, there was a fellow there. I mean, I'm showing sure kind of these pictures, which you probably know to show you the diversity of the occupation in, uh, in Liberty Park and Zuccotti Park. This is an American Indian fellow who is talking about the lie of the U.S. government, a history of enclosure that we sort of refer to briefly, but still lives on in different reservations all around the U.S. with the high suicide rate and whatnot. And this is something I like because uh, I like books. And uh, this is a library. <laughs> People have donated books. Uh, okay. Al Cave's uh, granddaughter, who lives in New York City, has asked uh, Al to donate one of his great it's books. Where? And it's there. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to really check anything out. <clears throat> this one girl was asking, how do you, how do you borrow these books? <laughs> Just pick it up and take it. And give, you know, put it back whenever you feel like it. So this is what, is what it looks like when people are gathering and doing the mic check. Um, when I was there, these two union brothers, from the Teamsters Union, came up and they were doing a mic check and announcing that they have a strike, you know, somewhere down in New York. So there's a bus waiting for you. Please come to the picket line. We'll give you a free subway pass if you do. I wanted to go, but I didn't have time. Um, very serious, and you know, my point is that all these different movements, different voices are coming together. This guy is doing a live stream. Uh, I don't know what his deal was. I didn't really talk to him. <laughs> At least was kind of annoyed, you know. <laughs> but uh, he was going and interviewing people, live broadcasts online. Yeah, Captain America. Uh, I I saw him, and I thought this guy was just maybe doing this as a joke. So I went up and asked him, so Captain America, what are you, you, know, what are you here for? And he said, well, uh, I, want, I want to tax the rich and uh, help the middle class and the poor. That's what I'm here for. You know, I was expecting some imperialist rhetoric to come out of Captain America, but you know, I changed my mind about Captain America. <laughs> 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 There's a guy from the, uh, V from Vendetta, right? A fat V wearing a guy's box <laughs> mask. I didn't talk to him. I don't know what this guy is, but his face was painted, striking figure. 
They got um, a guy meditating in the middle of the Zuccotti Park. A grain for peace. A grain for peace. Do you know this guy? I didn't recognize this guy until. <laughs> it is Mark later. Ruffalo. Mm -hmm. I think he's a Hollywood star, Mark Ruffalo, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I didn't, I didn't notice because all these celebrities come. And one of the good things about Zuccotti Park is it destroys that the sense of all tour celebrities. You're just like another guy talking. I mean, you and I can just go up there and start talking, and everybody will listen and repeat what we say right on the spot. <laughs> so good. He was doing something environmental. I don't like this sign. It says, not communist, not anarchist, not violent, not lazy, not anti-American, just want a better world. Mm -hmm. I don't like it because I don't see anything wrong with being a communist, anarchist, uh, I'm not sure about violent, but lazy, and I'm telling you, I Why not? I mean, yeah. I those things are kind of virtues, actually. But anyway, <laughs> it was good to see a black flag flying close by next to that young man. Or, you know, some signs that's really direct. <laughs> And so we, we kind of end with a note on death because there were a couple of young women who were carrying signs in memory of Troy Davis. And I was thinking about Troy Davis too in relation to what's been happening in Fukushima, the death of nuclear workers, the executions that I witnessed in historical memory, you know, in Sanya. And I don't really know how to organize these thoughts. I think Peter's work can help us because of his work on when I was thinking, when I was talking about this, you know, the dead bodies, the, the dissection of the bodies in, in Amsterdam and also in Japan, I was thinking of Peter's essay of Struggles Against the Surgeons in Albion's Fatal Tree, which is, just got reprinted by Versal this year. And I was also thinking of London Hank, uh, Thanatocracy, it's a term that Peter came up with to talk about rule by death as a necessary component of capitalist accumulation or development of you know, economic progress. Anyway, these two women made me remember not just about Troy Davis, uh, you know, execution by the Georgian state, uh, but also in the military industrial, I mean the prison industrial complex, that's all part and parcel of, uh, of the system we're talking about. But it made me also think about Fukushima, because right after the accident in, in Fukushima, there was a, a suicide. You know, just like there was a suicide of a food seller, you know, in Tunisia, Mohammed, who, who, who raised his kids since, I mean, who raised his brothers and sisters since the age of 13, and didn't have a quote-unquote license to sell his fruits, was abused by the state officials, you know, the local police, and committed suicide. And it's one of the, of course, uh, the many sources of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolution in the Arab Spring. Another suicide that took place after uh, in this year, uh, rather, was uh, in Fukushima, a farmer whose cows were contaminated by radioactivity, who couldn't live anymore because he, he couldn't sell his crops. You know, committed suicide, hanged himself, and wrote, uh, nuclear plants are to blame. So I think these three deaths kind of bring together a lot, a lot of themes. I have to kind of think about this with Peter and other people here. To, to organize my thoughts, but uh, I think one one hint that I got was uh, from Zuccotti Park itself, where women are doing the work of reproduction, washing dishes, which is absolutely necessary, cleaning the place, not just the woman, of course men too, because it is the woman, but largely the woman, but also some men, who are leading the struggle in Japan. I don't say this euphemistically or metaphorically, but this is true. I mean, factually, because the visible form of a struggle against nuclear power in Japan is a demonstration. The invisible, no less, perhaps more important part, is the daily work that these women, mothers, have done in organizing themselves and measuring with their Geiger counters and their instruments the level of radioactivity, because the government is lying all the way through. So they are collecting data to protect their children, and they do it together. Not only do they do this together, they're forming study groups to study nuclear power. So when there was a confrontation with the, the, uh, the representatives of the state, these mother came to Tokyo and argue on scientific terms. You know, uh, 
they have more knowledge. I mean, so Ikiyama Yoshiko said, this is not just a people's movement. It's also a, a scientific movement from below. And uh, another person who gave me clues about reproduction was Sylvia Federici, the author of Caliban and the Witch, a classic history about primary accumulation. If you're interested in some of the history I mentioned here, everybody should pick up this book. The Japanese friends I had, the, the friend Tomotsune, who, who led me through the Sanya, he's, he's read Sylvia's book in English. It's been translated and been highly influenced by it. And she's talking, he's doing a teaching at Liberty Park. Only like five or six people showed up. But she spoke of all the intensity and power of her you know, elegant moral energy and spoke about Peter's work, how the London Hanged is essential, you know, a necessary text for us to study in this moment of crisis. And I wanted to end with this particular image because uh, Peter, uh, a couple days ago when he asked me to come here, uh, spoke to me and mentioned <laughs> Gil Scott Heron and his phrase, you know, a guy from Detroit. Maybe Carter can tell me more about it. I love his stuff, but uh, the revolution will not be televised. Uh, of course, this has been, you know, used <coughs> to modify into, you know, television jingles, but the man's voice the man's ideas are so strong that when I was in Osaka, I didn't prompt it. I mean, my, my, my friends, the graduate students I mentioned in Osaka, who are also activists in Kamagasaki, mentioned Gil Scott Heron. We should use this phrase to talk together, to do a presentation at the conference we did in July about insurrection. And we did. So I want to end on that note, because uh, I want to hear more from you. But thank you for listening, and if you can help me refine and improve my thoughts, please uh, let me know. Uh, well, thanks for a very uh, moving uh, yeah, presentation. I, I love the pink, too, and the color. It's really nice, very sweet, and a very moving combination of uh, Carnality and spirituality. As uh, Manuel had said to me uh, before, that he wants to know uh, what we all are doing in Toledo. And since I live in Ann Arbor, I couldn't answer. That. So I think uh, from you, we need to to know, to give Manuel some ideas of, of what you're thinking, you know, what, what our last year has been like, and uh, what we're thinking about for uh, the next year, the next period. I have something to say, but I my mother keeps calling me like 15 times in a row. <laughs> Do better. If we take it away anything from today's presentation, whether it's in Japan or in Toledo, when your mother calls, you answer the phone. <laughs> and those those the kids in Oakland, I was telling uh, Diane, when they joined the general strike, they did so under the slogan, play nice and share. <laughs> Seems to me a good creed for the future. Call it communist or kindergarten. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Who was present at the uh, anti-nuke demo recently in Toledo? What? Um, Tell us I, guess I'll, I guess I'll start without without Michael, but. Um, my name is Stacy Jurich, and I'm working as campaign manager for Anita Rio. She's running for city council with the Green Party. So we're seeing a resurrection of the Green Party in Toledo through this campaign, um, the Lucas County Green Party. And um, on Halloween, we had a street theater protest against Davis Bessie, and it was raining. And um, we also had a press conference uh, the week before that, um, and 
in which we proposed, I um, actually have it with me because Michael and I were just at a city council meeting um, with a resolution to for city council to oppose the 20 year relicensing of Davis Bessie. Um, so we had a press conference to pr uh, when we announced that, and when I say we, it's a, a coalition of organizations and people. Um, and when we had that press conference, it was also raining. And then before that, on October 1st, there was the um, October 1st day, day of No Nukes rally. And so I guess that kind of kicked off a uh, resurgence of energy around the around Davis Bessie and, and, you know, with the 30 foot crack, that kind of. Um, let let some fire around the issue as well. So that's where that is. Um, we had some decent press for our press conference. Um, at right at it was kind of a citizen's response to the crack, and it was picked up by most of the press. The Blade had a couple of articles. Um, you know, decent fair coverage. Um, Plain Dealer picked up on it as well in Cleveland. So people are responsive. Uh, we're optimistic. Uh, we're going to get a resolution. I can pass it around, actually. Um, and this is all mostly to oppose the relicensing of Davis Bessie, which will expire in 2017. So it's this was a little bit too. What did he say? Too op opposition. Too much yeah. of opposition, and they're going to reword it so. Unfortunately, we have a Democratic Party here that is pro-nuclear, um, uh, and in the United States that is pro-nuclear. We have a president that is in the multinational energy companies coming out of Chicago, which is, has more nuclear power plants, um, Illinois, than any other state in the country. And Obama has been bought by the nuclear industry from when he was a senator from Illinois. Um, he had... Uh, put forth a resolution when there was a major leak of tritium from one of the nuclear reactors in the state of Illinois. And Obama came out strong saying that we're going to pass a resolution, we're going to pass a legislation in the, um, the uh, Senate in Illinois to um, force all nuclear power plants to release to the public whenever there is a radioactive release. Well, that forcing of re information being released in a three month period became nuclear power plants, if they release radiation into the public, can voluntarily um, give that information to the public if they feel like it. So it had absolutely no teeth after Intergy, the corporation, you know, started paying and the nuclear industry started funding the Democratic Party three to one over the Republican Party in the United States. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the past year because I coming coming from I've been in touch with Manuel sporadically but I was in Italy for three months this summer where um, or this spring where there was a referendum passed by a mass mobilization of the citizens to ban nuclear power permanently uh, the Berlusconi government um, the right-wing government under the pressure from the United States government an agreement with the center-left government in Italy which opened the door which were, there was a two-year period since 1994 when Berlusconi and the far-right uh, coalition was out of government and there was a center-left coalition government led by Romano Prodi um, that included the refund out, refounded uh, Communist Party in Italy. It was under the center-left government that the United States pressured Italy to opening the door to nuclear power after the Italian people in 1987, after Chernobyl, passed a resolution saying that they would never um, allow nuclear power built in uh, Italy. They said, well, that was an old resolution. Times have changed. We need nuclear power. The United States pressured Italy to say, we need you to open up to the nuclear power uh, game again. And under the center-left, government, they opened the door uh, in a meeting with uh, the former um, State Department under George Bush to nuclear power, and that was the center left. And then Berlusconi went ahead with plans to build 11 nuclear power plants across Italy, um, which is one of the most seismic areas in Europe, uh, and a peninsula surrounded by water, where there have been tsunamis historically as well. Um, and 
So the green lights were open to n developing nuclear power in Italy, and the, there was literally a mass uprising of the people to stop it. And it was done so through a democratic referendum that passed with over 56% uh, of the population voting. That in order for a referendum to have, um, to be considered, um, uh, to be accepted, in Italy, I guess how I would say it, to be legal, 50% of the voting population, registered voters, so a voting age, 50% of the voting age population plus one have to vote or the referendum doesn't have weight because in order, it's a quorum, yeah, in order for the referendum to be considered over 50% need to vote. It's never happened before in 25 years. It happened this spring because of a mass uprising of people up and down the coast. Um, in October, uh, October 1st, we had an, an International Day of Action Against Nuclear Power that was organized here in the United States, organized, led by a group called the Coalition Against Nukes, which is a completely grassroots organization spread out all over the country, and it has been working in direct solidarity with the uh, movement in Japan against nuclear power. Um, and I just wanted to bring Yesterday, there was a, an event in uh, New York called Occupy Japan um, that was uh, targeting the Japanese consulate in New York City, where uh, demand, a letter of demands was presented. But That's organized by some of my friends yeah. down in New York. Yeah, but they could not get in to the actual consulate offices. They were blocked by guards at the doors, and they had to read the demands um, to you know, force the get Japanese government that has completely abandoned the people of Fukushima, which is what uh, would happen if um, there were to be a nuclear accident at Davis Bessie. Uh, our government would, pro would uh, undoubtedly abandon us. Um, and Davis Bessie right here outside of Toledo has the worst record of any nuclear power plant in the industry. Um, we met with the city council just before we came here. They don't want to pass, they, they said a resolution to oppose the relicensing of Davis Bessie for another 20 years of operation is dead on the arrival. The city council will not support it, not even uh, the Steve Steele. So it's gonna be watered down into a resolution that says um, that um, if Davis Bessie is, uh, cannot prove that it's safely operating, then it should not be allowed to be relicensed, which doesn't really mean anything. Um, so, but this is the political landscape that we have to deal with here. You know, a Democratic Party that really has no backbone, stands for nothing, is all about celebrating the uh, great jobs offered by Davis Bessie um, and Sun Oil and British Petroleum, which are, you know, contaminating our air and our water and our land. So that's where we're at here, and uh, it's going to be a big struggle, but um, hopefully it's done in solidarity with the people of Japan. And I just wanted to mention also that that guy, Benny Zabel, that he had the photograph of, he came to New York for the October 1st, um, which was a national day of action, and it became international because there was an action in Tokyo uh, on October 1st and um, in cities all across the country. And uh, he went, so then there was this merging of that October 1st um, International Day of Action Against Nuclear Power with the Occupy Movement. And there's been constant workshops and presentations and networking going on since then. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thank you. That's a press packet that's going around that was it's compiled there's some documents about Davis Bessie and also some just of the promotional materials for the street theater and that was given to the press on, on Monday yeah, I guess I'll say a couple words about Occupy Toledo too mm -hmm. I mean you know um, <coughs> as kind of indicated by Michael you know um, and Stacy that that the uh, um, you know, activism in and around Toledo has sort of been, I don't know, um, a little limp in Toledo for quite a while. Um, and so it, it, I mean, it has 
some uh, some surges every once in a while, but for the most part, it's it's uh, fairly non-existent. And when Occupy Wall Street occurred, and uh, I remember hearing about um, Occupy Cleveland and, and Columbus getting ready to start up. You know, I put a, a little word out about uh, what do people think about an Occupy Toledo, and um, and actually in my circles. I only got about like two responses, but luckily someone else had decided to to push it, and like within within a week, actually within a couple of days of, of forming the Occupy Toledo Facebook page, um, you know we had 150 people uh, liking the page and <coughs> showing support, and within a few days after that we had our first organizing meeting and then 11 days after that Occupy Toledo was set up in downtown Toledo and and so I was you know and we had a real real good showing on the first day and I was very um, optimistic about 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 how things were going to go but the numbers have quickly fallen off we you know we're we've been concentrating solely on trying to keep the people that are staying overnight um, at Levis Square, um, you know, basically safe from the elements or people who are staying there overnight with no with no tents, no canopies, um, in the rain, um, and so we, you know, most of our efforts have been trying to, uh, I guess, to make a safe a safe and, and healthy place for for people to have dialogue and conversation, and and we're still um, kind of involved with that. So I, I Occupy Toledo is is struggling. Um, and so we need people to not only come down, you know, um, to show support. We need people to, to come down and, 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 and get involved. Um, we, we, we received some good news. I mean, we're, we're again, we're sort of, you know, holding it at arm's length that, that the city is considering allowing us to put up tents. Um, we had to resubmit our application um, and should hear today or tomorrow whether or not um, they're going to let us put up tents and, and be able to you know, protect people from the elements and be able to start the discussions and, and things that, that need to um, take place. Um, and here recently we just had some kind of bad publicity. Uh, People wanted to go to city council meeting and let them know that um, that who, who they represent, you know, that they represent the people. And um, while the the act of trying to take the First Amendment on a on a signboard into the um, city council meeting, I thought was uh, um, you know a, a, a bold statement and a legitimate statement and should have been allowed to go into that city council meeting um, the events that transpired after that um, just kind of went downhill and and now the whole discussion instead of instead of being about why he wasn't allowed to take some, you know free speech into the city council chamber it's now become because they they did some things afterwards that uh, um, you know where where a cop got kicked and 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 that and, and it's kind of uh, giving us some some bad publicity. But of course the whole thing never would have happened if if the person would have been allowed their constitutional right to take that sign into the um, into the room. So so we're struggling. We need we need people to come down. We need people to to help out and to be part of Occupy Toledo. Um, I mean, if we, you know, we have we have all sorts of different viewpoints uh, down there. Um, you know, there were some um, ISO socialists that were involved. There were uh, definitely people that you might label as just liberals, um, and then a few of us anarchists down there. Um, you know, uh, rounding out the mix, I guess you'd say, and uh, and so there's. You know, uh, there's room for everybody to to be involved, and you know, if if only a handful of people are there, what discussions, what comes out of it is not going to hold a lot of weight. So we need to be as inclusive and, and have as much participation by as much of the public as possible. So if you can spread the word and come down yourself, 
you know, you're welcome. There's also various committees too. Right. The, right. That you can find online. So we've um, we've heard from two different parts of uh, Toledo. One part connected with the anti-nuke and uh, political campaign of the Green Party, and we've heard of a recent Occupy Toledo. For those who don't know, I think there's a third um, development, which was led by uh, Cynthia Ingham and the History Department. Uh, Cynthia, would you like to speak for a minute to uh, the conference on last Friday? Well, we were, we were kind of um, taking the idea of peace um, a farther than the usual um, dialogue in which it's involved with war, but rather um, kind of exploring the idea that the absence of peace uh, has had a much more far-reaching impact on our society and the way that we relate, our perspectives, uh, what we are able to envision, and that uh, it's formed a kind of a trickle-down militarism, trickle-down militarism, uh, basically, that uh, uh, it acts as a kind of a corrosive um, on not only our institutions but on what we consider to be our possibility. So the conference was designed to be um, extremely wide-ranging and to bring in uh, a, as much community as possible but also to, um, to challenge people to think in terms of, of uh, uh, peace uh, in, a, in a slightly different way, in a more kind of holistic vision in scholarship terms to try and conceptualize peace as a category of analysis by like gender rather than just as a um, you know, state of being. So I think it was the peace conference, uh, if I may sure. go for it. make an addition in the context of Manuel's presentation, I couldn't but be affected as I think uh, all of us were by the the opening image at a, a Buddhist um, shrine and historical execution site and subsequent places of spiritual retreat or uh, of meditation. And this was certainly a characteristic of the peace conference that was here last Friday. It was held in, in memory of uh, Chuck De Benedetti and the active um, support of the Catholic Church, or at least of the parish that the university's in. So what I'm just trying to reflect to us is that we have like three different practices here, a spiritual one, a, a political party one, and one of uh, occupation. That's, um, I'm trying to see you know, who we are and, and how, we're, how we're learning from each other, spirit, occupation, and political party, because in the Occupy movement. There's been another theme that's developed that I don't that is not we haven't yet raised, which is not the class theme or the nuclear theme or the, the student debt theme, but it's rather the theme of of democracy, as you were saying. People didn't. That is the theme of of the general assembly. That that we do not work with representatives. That um, a, a friend of mine pointed out that represent is, comes from two words. One is re, and the other is present. We're, we're present again at the city council or Congress, but that presence again is somebody else's body. It's not our body. Our body is absent. And, and this, is, this notion of uh, being present in our own lives, in our own politics, has been brought to us by the general assemblies. Um, around, well, I th I'd say also around the world, because and there in, in London, for example, with the big cathedral, there, there's a massive spiritual debate, you know, in St. Paul's, with people resigning, and it's over this question. I mean, it's a multifaceted and deep question, and I'm just wondering how we're, th how we're thinking about it and how we might, we might change. Yeah. Uh, I am from Bowling Green, and I and I see that the Bowling Green occupation 
I have some problems. But I want to raise a question for Toledo especially because uh, I was at the first General Assembly. I have gone back. But I keep hearing that come and join us. You know, um, but there has to be a reason, not, not because of a real personal reason, but we have to get others to come. And I think like in, in Manuel's case, he, put, he puts it in correct context. In Japan, in Osaka, there is a history of people fighting against, you know, the nuclear power there. And it seems to me we haven't yet identified in Toledo. What is it that, we, that m many of us could come together on? I, I hear, as you said, there are three facets that I hear today, which I think are all very important. But I think that, I don't think people could get passionate with, I don't hear something that we, that we have that would bring many people out. I mean, there is something that we have to, have to identify, at least, so that, what is it in Toledo that we're really mad at, other than the banks, you know, and the, the capitalism that, that exists here? What is it that pisses everyone off that we can get people to come and, and join in? We have to identify that, I think, as a primary reason for people making to make this occupation grow. You know, I hear complaints and I, you know, I feel I feel for that the same people are there and there and, and I think it, it should be a cause of, of concern that it's not growing rather than it should be growing. It's what, three weeks now, four weeks, o October 10th. So I just want to put it out because I'm not privy to any of these meetings, but you know, I think about these things. And it, it seems like every time you read something else, there's something else, some challenge that comes up, which of course should be there. But it doesn't seem like we have yet anyway. So I, what is it that really pisses us off about Toledo? What is it, I mean? What, what are your thoughts? I don't live in Toledo, you see, but I observe Toledo. And I keep looking and, and waiting to hear what is it in Toledo that that really pisses people off? I mean, I mean, I'm serious about this because we can't keep saying that all the same people are, are occupying and so forth. Yes, that's true, and that's that's difficult. You know, I'm not saying that you you have to give those warriors a lot of credit. It's, it's not that, but I think the committees or whatever that meet should be able to address this question, you know. I mean, should we move, should we move and be, and be mobile from that side from once to once to go to Ottawa Hills or something like that? You know, it, it's like, the, the, as far as I see it, this Occupy movement has no precedent. So nothing holds us back from doing the same thing that, that, that we have been doing. And I just put that challenge, if anything else. That's, I don't have the answer either. I don't know. Perhaps we could hear from uh, some of the historians in the room, Diane and Al, about the precedence for the occupation movement or, or ideas that you have in response to this challenge. I was telling the, my graduate student class in here here that I was reminded of the um, 1932 occupation of Washington, D.C. by veterans of World War I who were looking for um, their bonuses and were driven out of the Capitol in a violent manner by order of the President and by the um, U.S. Army. I was reminded when, when the, um, the, the first incident in Oakland when the police um, cleared the Occupy movement in that city in what I thought was a similar militaristic manner. And I th there probably are, are other precedents that the uh, general strike that was just um, repeated in, in Oakland again. Some of you know I have personal connections to Oakland, which is why 
part of my interest comes from, but um, a very successful general strike yesterday, and I, I live with someone um, who I love dearly, but has a habit I don't care for, and that is the TV's on constantly on, on um, um, network stations. And I think I mentioned to you when I came in, I found it very irritating that network TV has largely ignored the powerful message of 7,500 people peacefully gathering in downtown Oakland and instead focuses on a fire every time the news comes on. I think that's part of the problem with the Occupy movement is the way that mainstream media handles coverage and that they tend to focus on um, on sensational aspects of the movement. The same, I, I, I thought of the same thing when, when you were speaking about the incident at um, the city council meeting, that that was the focus of the mainstream coverage, which I think most ordinary people, that's, that's what they see of, of the movements. <coughs> and I think that kind of, of um, representation and language reminded me of, of Al's comments that, that my students discussed eloquently in class yesterday, the undergraduates, about the, the use of, of language to um, uh, characterize groups of people. So, I don't know, those are just some press, I some things I've been thinking about the last few days. Gardner, you're going to give us some uh, some words I gotta go teach a class. Oh. <laughs> it starts at 3.30. Well, so thanks for coming. But I've enjoyed this. Thanks for inviting me, too. I mean, for example, I, I don't mean to be off topic here. Uh, downtown Toledo has been totally taken over. Huntington Field is a bank, right? I mean, Huntington Field, a bank. Fifth Third Field, that's a bank. You know, it's like, what has happened has been, the, been the, I don't know, is the displacement of people to, uh, to for these stadiums to be built? You know, uh, the type of things like that, that, <coughs> that I see some possibility of, of hooking on to something. Uh, uh, both, uh, I think both Manuel and Al Cave were trying to get us to think about the relationship between banks and foreclosures banks and the loss of land. They're, tr they're trying to, to, s to get us to start thinking about why banks are so prominent, but at the same time, our lives are so miserable. Uh, they tell us we can have a job if we go to college. We can only go to college if we go in debt. We can only go in debt, you know, if we... Uh, and then going in debt and graduating from college, the rate of unemployment is so high. It's 9.1 percent for college graduates now, and it's getting higher. So what is the relationship? And what, what like last week we saw, we saw, if you read the newspapers, and even perhaps on TV, on the main media, you could see that, oh, everyone's happy in Europe because they've developed a new uh, way of bailing out Greece, <laughs> and the stock exchange went up a little bit. The next day, the president of Greece says, well, let's see what the Greek people have to say about it. You know, the birthplace of democracy is say we're going to put this to a vote. And immediately the stock exchange drops. Immediately the banks go into profit. So there's an obvious contradiction between democracy and the banks. And the people must be brought to see it. I've been reading with some interest these recent articles on poverty in Toledo <laughs> in, in the Blade. Yeah, yeah. For one thing, I'm gratified that the Blade's finally noticed. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not surprised the Blade doesn't deal with the root causes of it. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't talk about employment practices. They don't it's talk about profit. bank policies and what have you. But the thing that really strikes me is that a lot of the people who are unemployed were not in the middle class anymore who have gone from 80000 a year to trying to, to live on nothing, seem to think that maybe they were unlucky, they got sick, their company went bad, and they're not like those other people who are taking a handout who just don't want to work. And some of the comments on the part of the people who are still fortunate 
toward the unemployed are pretty vicious. But it occurs to me that at some point, at some point, large numbers of people are going to understand who's really robbing them. But it isn't Obama, and it isn't welfare cheats. It's the corporations, it's the banks. It's the kind of system that makes it profitable for a banker to make millions of dollars by, pardon the brute state, statement, screwing most of his customers. You know, the evidence is there. What the movements have to do is get it out in front of people because the media do everything possible to turn it in the other direction. But I think that these occupations are an indication that there is a change in consciousness. There is a discovery of who the enemy is. Warren Buffett says there's a class war that's been going on for years, so we're winning it. At some point, people are going to realize they're in a class war and they're losing it. And they have to empower themselves. Now, how do we get that message through? How do we get it through? I don't know. But I think if there is a single thing that might purify Toledo, it would be the realization of the extent to which the American dream is a lie. Because working hard, playing by the rules, won't save you if you get in the way of somebody's profit, which of course is the basic fundamental nature of capitalism. It has to come. I don't think there's no country with it. half a century will be socialist. We'll call it something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For whatever that's worth. I don't think there's any other better example of the uh, city where the American dream is a lie than Toledo. I mean, we have our drinking water lines run directly under a hazardous waste yes. landfill and virus safe. We've got the most decrepit nuclear power plant right outside our city. We've got a constant cloud of dioxin over the east side um, that's poisoning the air. We have some of the highest asthma rates and cancer rates in the entire United States. I've been going door to door since September in the city, in the central city of Toledo. It's half abandoned, boarded up, foreclosed by banks, you know. Just a complete and utter sense of decay and abandonment. Every neighborhood, north end, west end, yeah. south end, all the same. And um, I think that, you know, our part of the problem is that there's a, 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 a political establishment in Toledo that keeps people down and keeps people um, geared towards, you know, I'm working for the SEIU, the Service Employees Union, and I can tell you I've come across almost every day on turf somebody that is represented by this union that feels like the union's not doing a damn thing for them that their, uh, their full-time positions are getting cut to part-time, that their benefits are being taken, and that the union stewards are absent. They're working on uh, stopping issue, f uh, stopping Senate Bill two. 5 and, 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 and you know, the vote no on issue 2, which is what I'm paid to do. And I'm completely against the stripping of collective bargaining. But at the same time, the coll collective bargaining that goes on in Toledo by these union leaders is toothless and worthless, you know? Um, on almost every scale, so I have a, a mixed thing, but I think that the people are getting the message. I think it's a matter of time. I think the numbers will build to from traditional organized labor communities after the election. I think we will be able to get more numbers out downtown, and I, I think as long as we are resilient, I think Occupy will continue to build. I mean, I saw poll numbers today. The Daily Beast just named Toledo the 11th brokest city in the country. Um, the 36% um, though of the American public say they support the uh, um, perspective, the values of the Occupy movement. 36% is a good, you know, number of people, and um, and I think Toledo you would even find it higher probably. It's just those people are not used to being politically active. They're not used to taking a stand. So it's a matter of us reaching out and giving them ways to participate. <coughs> I, I, I want to follow on, a, on the 11 11 11. There's been a call for an international uh, day of action again, which is November 11th, which is Veterans Day. And, and in downtown Toledo, there's going to be a march um, organized by Occupy Toledo on the 11th of November. So this is another opportunity. 
on Veterans Day for people to get involved. It'll be after the election, so we're going to focus on doing a lot of outreach to flop the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, the Teamsters, the U UT, U A A U P, the university professors here say, oh, as soon as the election's over, we're going to get more involved. So we'll see. The 11th is after the election. So. <laughs> um, you know, Mike, when you were yeah. talking about Eric, did you hear something to say? Toledo. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. About environment. It occurs to me that corporate America and the political parties have done an excellent job of selling the people on the notion that the trade-off is between protecting the environment and keeping jobs. Mm -hmm. What really has to be exposed is that the fouling of the uh, environment is extremely profitable, not to labor, yeah. but to investors, banks, corporations, what have you. You know, once again, they have to understand who the enemy is, what their self, where their self-interest really lies. So, um, so others who haven't spoken for uh, yeah, have contributions, I, like Eric and uh, Brad? I mean, given the presentation that you gave, Manuel, and uh, a lot of the comments, I've been thinking on the theme of enclosure that runs through this entire issue, for example, separating job growth from the environment. Those issues have been fractured, and each issue becomes enclosed. We've talked about multiple different perspectives that we're trying to take to address common issues that we all have, but each group is doing it in isolation. In some way, the reason that people were arrested at the city council meeting is because there's been such an, you know, an increase in the need for permits to do anything that, you know, government and the people have become separated and closed off. As far as people losing their jobs, people have been made to feel that it's their personal fault, yeah. that it is separated from some sort of larger problem. So people are becoming enclosed into their own individual problems. I mean, when I li and you mentioned, Mike, um, what happened in Chicago with the nuclear plants. I've just recently moved from Chicago, and we did not hear very much about this issue. So separating people and fracturing them from information, I, the protests in Japan, trying to separate the protesters into small groups to make society look yeah. more complacent than it actually is. So this theme of enclosure, I think, is certainly very prevalent in all of these separate issues that really have a common voice, but are made to feel that they're working in isolation from each other. And that's just the point that I wanted to make. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not really here representative of anybody. I'm just here because of me. I'm a student here. And, you know, I, I don't really have a whole lot to say, especially considering some of the words said by people much smarter than myself. But um, we were trying to talk about a little bit earlier the importance and the, uh, the role of banks in America. And I was, I was thinking about it. And I think what's happened with banks in America is that they've crossed that very fine line that all businesses waver on. And I don't know that there's a point that we can specifically say, ah, this is where it has happened. But I think what's happened with banks is they've crossed that fine line of providing a good or service or trying to turn profit. You know, most businesses, yes, they want to stay in business. But when I go to, there's a wonderful diner in my hometown that I frequent all the time. And when I go there, I know that, yes, they want to make a little bit of money, but their number one concern is serving me up the best hamburger and french fries that I can possibly get in my town. You know, I go to the library, and I know that their goal is they want me to go there and enjoy the books, which I, of course, do. I'm a very large bibliophile. And that's what they want me to do. They don't want me to go there and spend a whole lot of money and put money into the pockets of the people who own it. They want me to enjoy their good or service and benefit from it the best that I can. And I think that's part of the problem that people have with the banks anymore in America. Is they don't seem to have that, I don't want to call it altruistic, but they don't seem to have that benevolent aspect anymore. They seem to say, okay, well, we'll provide you with the service, but we're going to try and get as much out of you as we can, in fact, more so than we're going to be willing to give out. So I think that's where a lot of the disenfranchisement, I guess, is lack of a better word, comes from American people towards banks. They don't seem to be working for us. We almost seem to be working for them. Mm -hmm. You know what you can do immediately by Friday? If you have a bank account, 
close it and move all your money to a credit union. Mm -hmm. Credit unions are democratic. They're idea. they're controlled by it's a national movement. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it. Right. <laughs> I've I've been a credit union member for thirty five years, and so um, I'm I've always been a strong advocate of credit unions. Anyway, they're run by boards of members. So um, I, I, right now I belong to the UT Credit Union. I belong to it since I moved here. But there's credit unions everywhere that anyone can join. Usually, you just have to know another person. It will undermine the power of banks if, if enough people do that. I think it's a really important movement, and the uh, target date's um, November 5th. Hmm. Good. That's a, a date to remember, is the 5th of November. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, um, I'm, not, I'm not really a hopeful person, <laughs> small age. I'm a, I'm a hopeful person with a big age, um, but not a hopeful person with a small age. And, of some of the things that, you know, I, I'm always touched by how um, people believe that if you just explain it to people, they'll get it um, and they'll, they'll respond to it. And I guess I, I have a lot of problems with that. Um, because there's something else, and this is what I'm struggling with myself, there is something else going on. Uh, the gentleman from Bowling Green, Bowling Green says, uh, what makes Toledo mad? I don't think anything makes Toledo mad. Yeah. Um, so what is it? that where is that critical point where people are willing to perceive and actually open themselves to all of the things that we could explain to them if only they would be open to it. Um, and I come from Des Moines and you know Des Moines is like always pissed. You know, I mean they are and, and they just they, they are extremely active. One of the things that they have is a Catholic worker movement. And this goes back to what Peter was talking about, about the spiritual dimension, that there is something below the practicality, below the economic arguments, below all of these arguments that needs to be touched uh, in order for people to start to reconceptualize their world. Because what we're asking of them is not policy changes, but we are asking that they reconceptualize all of the isms uh, that are now in play. And, and that's going to take more than just cogent arguments and rational arguments. It's going to take something else, which I don't know what that is, um, but in, as I come, you know, I've only been here three years, and as I compare the two, um, you know, I can't help but notice that that's, that's one of the elements, is a very strong uh, combination there um, between what, you know, for lack of a, for inaccurately, and for lack of a better phrase, is the secular and the, and, and the sacred. Um, and so that's you know, I don't know what makes Toledo mad. I wish I knew. Um, but, uh, and I think that part of what Mike is saying, it's the big lie. I mean, there is so much, and the language doesn't address the lie anymore. We in the university can attest to that, right? With our transparencies and our consumerism and our stakeholders and all that crap. Uh, so the language doesn't even serve us anymore, which brings me to the revolution will not be televised, which an alternative to that is, is that the revolution will be poeticized because it will be poetry uh, and an expansion of the language that's going to touch on those concepts uh, that will enable us to reach somebody. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah, thanks. We don't want you going back to Des Moines. Yeah. So uh, I think we got to change. Uh, but we got. I can I can wait at some point. Did you want to? No, no, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, greetings from the other side of the border. I'm from Michigan, so. Yeah, um, actually around Detroit, so when you talk about Toledo being empty, uh, I know how it feels. Um, and uh, that dream just said what makes people mad, and I've been thinking about why you know, a lot of this stuff happens. And I'll tell you what makes people in Toledo mad, and I'll tell you what makes people in Detroit mad, it's each other. <laughs> Most, if you get mad at anybody, it's either your neighbor or the next town over. And I can tell you in Detroit, the big art, I can, I, you don't have to guess what the big argument's been. It's been the same since, you know, Dearborn and Detroit almost went to blows with each other. I mean, people get caught up in artificial barriers of race, or they get caught up in artificial barriers of uh, industry, you know. Um, and I, I don't know what we can do to get over that more than we already have, as far as us individually. It's like banging your head against the wall sometimes. So, so uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you didn't ask earlier, but, but I thought of something. Uh, there, there's been a lot of foreclosures in, in the city. You know, not that it's any higher or easier than other cities. But there's public data available 
what bank foreclosed where in this county or city? Have we thought about addressing the people? People have been affected. It's not that you have to explain to them that their house has been foreclosed. If we present data like that, that's nothing that we're talking to them about. We're telling them that maybe I'm next, you know, but what bank so-and-so did so-and-so and so-and-so, and so we can get data. It's publicly available. So I, I, I thought you had asked me earlier about it. And then just really quickly to address, it is happening. There's a group called Fight for a Fair Economy that is looking into the foreclosure situation in Toledo. And one aspect of the Occupy movement is possibly this winter going to be um, uh, uh, taking over um, foreclosed homes and living in them, squatting in them. Thanks, so Mark. it is it is an ongoing development. Yeah. Let's see if other people who have something to I'd just like to, to point out that Toledo <clears throat> you see signs in people's yards that say foreclosure bus tours. So I don't think there's a whole lot of sympathy in Toledo for things like foreclosure. I mean, it's What's certainly not going to energize me. So you can get on a, a bus and go see the properties that have been foreclosed on so that you can then go try and get them for a song. Really? Uh, they, yeah, are. absolutely. So, so I, I don't think that's where you're going to find uh, some fee empathy. or mm -hmm. uh, how you're going to energize people. Yeah, these are vultures circling the carcasses <laughs> of a dying system. I mean, I don't and know did if you, you have to energize through anger or if you find other ways to energize Toledo, you know? I mean, do you have to find out what pisses people off or do you have to find out what gets people involved? And it doesn't have to be because they're pissed off necessarily. I don't even think we're energizing through anger right now. I think we're trying to energize through apathy. I mean, I think a lot of people honestly just can't muster up the ability to care, which is really unfortunate. But I think that's a big problem right now too. It's not whether or not people are angry or if they want to go out and do something. It's that they just you get a lot of people that just don't care. The people, the way they live right now in in neighborhood after neighborhood in Toledo is cloistered in their houses with the blinds all drawn, clutter everywhere. And the TV on full blast, yeah. and that's it. Sounds like home. I just, <laughs> <laughs> just got Comcast yesterday. I could fit right in. You're doomed. Um, let me just ask: Are there others who have something to say before I ask Stacy? Who had her hand up, and then um, Jesse and then Manuel? Perhaps we'll end with. Uh, Politicization of the politicalization. <laughs> Dan. Just a quick parallel when Manuel was talking about the farmer who committed suicide because his uh, herd was contaminated. Um, you know, on the farm where I come from, there are a lot of, uh, there are several recent instances of suicides um, in central Ohio near our farm. Um, where farmers have gotten foreclosed upon and they've had to get rid of their cattle. Um, so that's, you know, that works, that works here too with the banks, back to the banks again. Well, I was, I was kind of, I was very happy that Dr. Ingham brought up the poetization of language. Because I wanted to say something about that, but I, I would have thought, thought you would have laughed at me. Oh. <laughs> no. But now that she said it, I feel, I feel more confident, but <laughs> I think well, what I mean by that is not necessarily all we need to write really good poetry or take poetry classes or be scholars of poetry, although, although we should do those things to a, to a small extent, I think. <coughs> but I think, I think language is beaten into us as a thing of use on the Facebook and the cell phones and everything else in this information society, or whatever, whatever it's called. And the, I think when we talk about poetry, I think we're talking here about spontaneity, about creating different discourses creating new ones outside of the, the free spaces of speech that are imposed on us. And that and that's I think that's a starting point for human freedom, a starting point for spontaneity. It's the, right, it's the way we communicate about the world, the way we use that medium called language. And so, the, I mean, the problem is you can't just start there and stay there. I still live in my little imaginative world, and that's, that's not good enough. Dr. Leinbaugh said Tuesday to me, take responsibility. You know, like a, <laughs> like a really bad father, but... <laughs> but he, he or a really good father. <laughs> or, but, but he was he was right about that. And I think, but I think it's a starting point. Or 
think about, uh, I remember you were talking about the Tempest uh, Friday. Think about Caliban, who, who's, who, was lear who, who, was, who learned language from Prospero and Miranda, and he said, okay, now I can curse. That doesn't mean we need. Yeah, that doesn't mean we need to use vulgar language. It just means we can use use things like that and create a different discourse. And I think that's a good starting point. It's not an ending point. It's not even close. But there, yeah, there's something powerful in poetry that I haven't be I haven't begun to grasp. It it shreds apart to all these philosophical discourses that I'm always into. It shows them that something like that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Stacy, oh, Stacy, I'm sorry. Uh, football games just started coming up as responses to people statements people were making too many times for me not to mention it. Uh, as far as what makes people mad, uh, <laughs> what what people in Toledo are doing, and you know you could fill up the UT football stadium at what are tickets now seventy five dollars, but how many people came to the peace conference last Friday? And so that's that's where people's minds are. That's what people are important. That's what's important to people. And um, you know they're apparently okay with the status quo right now, and the the media influence. And um, Toledo is a very apathetic community, and and uh, it's hard to get them to do anything. But uh, they'll show football games. It's some kind of line, the Detroit Lions and the Occupy Toledo. Fantastic <laughs> 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 turnout. <laughs> we need a big screen TV, though. So let's, <laughs> yeah. let's wind it up here, and uh, Manuel will, will take us home. I won't keep you long because when I was in Zuccotti Park, uh, I, you know, right now I have to go, go to the bathroom and take a piss. <laughs> and when I was in Zuccotti Park, there was no bathroom at all. In the park, so everybody has to piss in the, uh, you know, the Burger King and the rest of the joints around. And when I was looking for a bathroom there, I really had to go. Uh, it was line after line of people, and I pissed in my pants basically. And I finally found a place, and then I was able to go to the bathroom. So learning from this lesson, I'm going to keep myself uh, short and won't keep you all. So, uh, well, I'm really glad uh, for Cynthia and Jesse for talking about the politicization. Of, uh, of revolution because uh, Steve who's videotaping all this stuff, he and I and others and BG, SU Arrow you're also involved in the great fermentation and streaming of poetry from the stages of open mic at least in two, for about a semester or so. So I want to kind of close with, uh, with poetry. I was sort of thinking whether or not to do this but uh, for lack of time and because I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll just read the second stanza of Allen Ginsberg's Plutonian Ode and close. The bard surveys Plutonian history from midnight lit with mercury vapor, street lamps till, and dawn's early light. He contemplates a tranquil politic spaced out between nations thoughtful and proliferating bureaucratic and horrific armed Satanic industries projected sun with five hundred billion dollars strength around the world. Same time, this Texas set in Fukushima, Kamagasaki, Sanya before front ranges of Mount Fuji, twelve thousands of miles of uh, north of the Davis Bessey nuclear facility, in the United States or North America, Western Hemisphere, or planet Earth, six month and fourteen days around our solar system in a spiral galaxy, the local year after the meaning of the last god, 1978, completed as yellow haze down, dawn clouds brightens east. Toledo white below blue sky, transparent rising, empty deep and spacious to a morning star high over the balcony. Above some auto set with wheels to curb, downhill from flat irons, jagged pine ridge, sunlit mountain meadows slope to a rust red sandstone cliffs above brick, townhouse roofs, sparrows, Wake to whistling through marine streets, summer green leaf trees. This ode to you, O oh poets and orators to come. You Father Whitmans, as I join your side. You Congress and American people, occupation, Wall Street. You present mediators, spiritual friends and teachers. You, O oh master of diamond arts, take this wheel of syllables in hand. These vowels and consonants to breath's end. Take this inhalation of black poison to your heart. Breathe out this blessing from your breast. 
on our creation. Forests, cities, oceans, de deserts, rocky flats and mountains in the ten directions pacify with its exhalation, enrich this plutonium ode to explode its empty thunder through earth and thought worlds, magnetize this howl with heartless compassion, destroy this mountain of plutonium with ordinary mind and body speech, thus empower this mind guard spirit gone out, gone out, gone beyond, gone beyond me, wake space, so ah. Uh, your voices, your words are living inside of my head. I'll be moving to West Covina next week. Uh, I've lived here for 12 years. It's so good to have seen all of you and to have had this meeting. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, before we go, let's, let's try to make a circle and do a circle. We call it a circle five. So you stand up and you put your hands out like this. All right, come on, Steve. Let's do let's do the circle five for our way of saying goodbye to Manuel. Get in there, Justin. You and, and I'll step back here.